Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome back to Dark Poutine. I am Mike Brown, and here in the Dark Poutine studio in Langley, B.C., all alone, but... I'm over here. You're over there. And who are you again? I am Matthew. You say you want to introduce yourself, and then you don't even bother to do it. <laughs> People know who I am. Don't you know who I am? Oh, no. <laughs> I've created a monster. <laughs> no. You know, I'm not like that at all. No, Matthew Stockton. How are you today? I am good. That's I am, good. I am good. I'm, I'm looking forward to... My mom's coming to visit on the 19th of this oh, month. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Listener discretion is strongly advised. We're not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We're two ordinary Canadians chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to dark poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work, family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. Ezra Allen Miner, more commonly known as Bill Miner, was an infamous American stagecoach and train robber born in Michigan in 1846. Bill Miner's criminal career included an early arrest on April 3, 1866 for robbery leading to a three-year sentence at San Quentin. Over a span of 35 years, Miner was incarcerated for almost 30 years experiencing two official releases and making five escapes from custody. He became infamous in Canada for robbing the Canadian Pacific Railway, CPR, and securing his status as a legendary figure in Canadian outlaw lore, which included an escape from the notorious BC Penitentiary in New Westminster. Known by nicknames such as the Grey Fox and the Gentleman Bandit, Miner was celebrated for his courteous demeanor during his heists. Furthermore, he is often credited with popularizing the now iconic command during robberies, hands up. However, this may be hyperbole. Miner's blend of politeness and notoriety helped him cement his legacy in the annals of Canadian criminal folklore. This is Dark Poutine, episode 314, The Life of the Grey Fox, Bill Miner, Train Robber. My introduction to this notorious train robber came through one of my favorite desserts at the Keg Steakhouse chain, Billy Miner Pie, named for the infamous old-timey outlaw. This dessert comprises a cappuccino ice cream cake built upon an Oreo crumb crust garnished with sliced almonds and generously drizzled with warmed chocolate fudge and caramel sauces. It's a yummy treat and it's as tempting to look at as it is to eat. You won't be disappointed. Don't tell them I sent you because they don't know who I am. Once you're hooked, you can buy Billy Minor Pie flavored ice cream in 500 milliliter tubs if you want to fix at home. Failing that, the internet is also chock full of decent DIY Billy Miner Pie recipes. 
So what in a Billy Minor pie? Is there anything that has to do with Billy Minor? Well, I guess the maybe the uh, Oreo parts look like uh, like dirt, like mining, and the. I see. So I was thinking maybe a little toy train at the keg comes out to like woo woo comes around to your table. Well, and then it takes your wallet as it leaves. <laughs> well, it's sort of like those. Um, I, I've never seen one here in Vancouver, but in London there's tons of them, like Yo Sushi. Yes, I went to that in uh, Heathrow. Are there any of those in Canada? L- little conveyor belts because they're all over the place in London. I've seen a couple of them, and there's one here in Vancouver. At least there used to be. I think it was called Tsunami Sushi, and it was little boat that came by in a convey on a conveyor belt it was really cool i saw online that there's a cheese restaurant and it brings cheese around on plates no oh, that's fun but let's get back to bill minor who the heck was this guy and so infamous that the keg had to name a dessert after him the outlaw remembered now most commonly as bill minor was born ezra allen minor throughout his career minor used numerous aliases including California Bill, William A. Morgan, and George Edwards, among others. According to authors Mark Dugan and John Bessenecker in their book, The Gray Fox, after sorting through scads of inaccurate information, historical evidence confirms Miner's birthplace as Vevey Township, Michigan, on December 27, 1846, to Joseph and Harriet Miner. Some accounts have Bill born in Bowling Green, Kentucky, including a few of his own, in 1847. However, Dugan and Bessenecker dispute this. Bill's tales of early adventures, including a daring ride through Apache territory and running a mail service for exorbitant fees, are debunked by geographic and historical inaccuracies, such as the non-existence of Apaches in Southern California and the physical impossibility of his claimed rides. These stories are characteristic of Miner's love for creating a more colorful version of his life than reality might have allowed. His actual background, the son of Joseph Miner from Connecticut and Harriet Jane from New York, who settled in Michigan, was far more mundane. This contrast highlights the disparity between the legend Miner wished to present and the verifiable facts of his family and origins. Bill's father, Joseph, was born in 1810 in New London, Connecticut to Ezra and Mary Miner and married Harriet Jane in 1833, who was born in 1816 in New York. The couple initially lived in Connecticut, where their first daughter, Harriet R., was born in 1834. They moved to Vevey Township, Ingram County, Michigan, in 1836, where Joseph began farming. The miners expanded their family and land holdings in Michigan, with their children Henry Clay, born 1840, Mary Jane, born 1843, and Ezra Allen Bill, born in 1846. Joseph acquired land through bounty land laws, benefiting from ancestral service, supposedly in the War of 1812. After Joseph Miner's death, his estate was divided among his children. In 1859, Harriet Miner, his widow, arranged for a guardian to sell their Clinton property. She used the proceeds to move her family, including 13-year-old Bill, to California's gold mining town of Yankee Jim's. The motivations and details of their journey remain speculative, but this move significantly impacted Bill Miner's later life. Bill's mother, Harriet, possibly homeschooled her sons. Meanwhile, Bill's brother, Henry, remained in Michigan, enlisting in the military in 1864, only to die of dysentery later that year, leading to a federal pension for Harriet, who then returned to Michigan, leaving her 18-year-old son, Bill, behind. In March 1864, Bill Miner communicated plans to visit his mother and possibly return east himself, but he didn't follow through. By April of the same year, he'd enlisted in the Union Army as William Allen Miner, the first record of using his name, Bill Miner. Bill's military service was brief. He deserted in July 1864, reflecting his disdain for authority. He didn't like being told what to do. Raised in the mining camp of Yankee Jim's, Bill's early work as a laborer likely involved mining, a skill set reflected in his later life. Following his military desertion, he returned to work in Placer County's mines, laying the groundwork for his future in crime. Billy Miner's actual entry into crime likely occurred in 1863. It started with a horse theft in Los Angeles County, leading to his arrest and a quick release on bail. 
with charges probably dismissed due to a witness issue. His initial crimes were amateurish, including robbing his employer of $300 in 1865. That would have been a lot of money then. An act overlooked due to his youth. Well, I guess if you can get away with it. In one of his only solo crimes, at 19, Miner stole a high-priced suit and a gold watch in Auburn, demonstrating his bold yet inexperienced criminal behavior. Despite a search by local authorities, Miner escaped back to Yankee Jim's. So as far as we know, his first real foray into crime was stealing this horse in 1863. That's right. So what was that called back then? Was it called like Grand Theft Equus? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no? And hey, there's an idea. What if there's like an 1860s version of, of the game Grand Theft Auto called Grand Theft Equus? Well, guess what, Matthew? What? There is. No. It, it's called Red Dead Redemption. Oh, okay. And there's been two versions of it. It's made by Rockstar, which also made Grand Theft Auto. Okay. And uh, in it, you can steal horses and other things, rob stage co- coaches, trains, and uh, even tie someone up and throw them on the train tracks for them to be run over. Wow. Yeah. Ma, see, every time I have an idea, somebody else has already done it. Me too. Um, you know what I'm thinking of? Do you know that uh, Velvet Underground song? You robbed the stagecoach in the rain. And I'm, I've been singing that ever since I read this script. Oh, there you go. That's a good song. I'm sticking with you, I think it's called. Bill Miner continued his criminal endeavors stealing horses in Forest Hill and heading to San Francisco to sell them, where he picked up John Sinclair as an accomplice. Miner's pattern of never working alone and choosing easily influenced partners began to emerge. After enjoying San Francisco's vices, Miner and Sinclair robbed a ranch hand near the San Joaquin River. Their spree continued until law enforcement, informed by their previous victim and a telegram about the stolen horses, arrested them in Woodbridge. Despite their capture, Miner and Sinclair planned an escape from jail, attempting to tunnel through a wall and plotting to overpower the jailer, which ultimately failed due to vigilant jail monitoring. Their arrest and failed escape attempt highlighted Miner's boldness and resourcefulness even in the face of consequences. Bill Miner and John Sinclair were indicted for robbery, facing trials and convictions in San Joaquin County, with Sinclair and Miner both sentenced to three years in San Quentin in April 1866. Despite their situation, they appeared cheerful on their way to prison. Unlike his later fabrications, Miner accurately registered his personal details in San Quentin. Conditions in the prison were dire, characterized by brutal disciplinary methods and minimal comfort in overcrowded cells, Placer County pursued charges against Miner for horse theft, leading to additional sentences in 1866. At San Quentin, Bill Miner encountered a prison environment where homosexuality was prevalent, particularly in secluded areas like the jute mill where he worked. With his youthful appearance, Miner was likely a target for other convicts. Sociological studies suggest that the absence of heterosexual opportunities led many prisoners, including minor, to seek same-sex relationships as a means of maintaining their masculine identity and coping with the isolation from women. Bill Minor adapted to the prison's sexual dynamics, engaging in homosexual relationships that became a part of his identity during and after his incarceration. These aspects of his personal life remained private until revealed by the Pinkerton Detective Agency in 1903 during an investigation. As one can imagine, during the 1860s and 1870s in North America, societal attitudes toward homosexuality were predominantly negative, reflecting the broader Victorian-era norms that emphasized traditional gender roles and confined sexual behavior within the bounds of heterosexual marriage. Homosexual acts were criminalized under sodomy laws in many states and provinces, and those engaging in same-sex relationships faced the risk of severe penalties, social ostracization, and violence. The period also marked the beginning of discussions around homosexuality in medical and psychiatric circles, often pathologizing it as a form of mental illness. Despite the societal condemnation and legal restrictions, burgeoning homosexual subcultures began to form in urban areas, providing some semblance of community and safety for those involved. These subcultures operated discreetly due to the ever-present risks of discovery and persecution, 
the public discourse on homosexuality when it occurred typically revolved around scandal and criminal cases further entrenching the stigma against same-sex relationships. Now, just to pull the curtain back a little bit, I didn't know I was going to be telling this kind of story when I started talking about Bill Miner. I didn't know anything about him, really. The gays can be stagecoach robbers as well. Sure. This is interesting. So That was the 1800s. And yeah. You're like, oh, it was so different way back then, right? Well. But being gay was illegal in the U.S. until 1962 in Illinois. Then in 2003, mm-hmm. my 2003. Yeah. Not 1993, 2003, 21 years 21 ago. 21 years ago. Lawrence versus Texas, the Supreme Court went all the way up and essentially invalidated all anti-gay laws. It was a 6-3 decision. Of course, there, there's members of the Supreme Court that voted against it that are still on the Supreme Court. Like who? Clarence pubic hair on the Coca-Cola Thomas. Oh, that guy. Yeah. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. Yeah. But also gay subcultures. My husband came home from the gym yesterday and turns to me and goes, I don't know how to talk to gay people anymore. Oh, no. And I said, what do you mean? He's like, well, I think they all go out to clubs and bars and stuff and they're all chatting. And he's like, it's Tuesday. You saw each other on the weekend. What do you have to talk about? He's like, and I'm like, I think he's called getting old, Justin. That could be it. <laughs> Bill Miner was released in early 1870 due to good behavior, but he developed a taste for the criminal life, and on leaving prison, he was already thinking about his next moves. Bill Miner teamed up with James Alkali Jim Harrington, a former prison mate known for his criminal expertise. Alkali Jim introduced Miner to advanced criminal activities, including burglary and stage robbery, emphasizing escape tools and strategic betrayal. With Charles Cooper, another ex-convict, they engaged in home burglaries and planned a stagecoach robbery, showcasing Miner's strategy and interaction with victims, characterized by intimidation mixed with politeness. Despite Cooper's initial reluctance, he joined the robbery, which was carefully executed, avoiding unnecessary violence and even showing compassion toward their victims. The trio's successful escape and Miner's purchase of a new suit with the loot highlighted his adaptability and the beginning of his criminal legend, albeit without evidence, of him coining the phrase, hands up. I'm kind of picturing him doing it like because he's gay, like the YMCA. Oh, hands up. (laughs) Like, why, (laughs) MCA, hands up. (laughs) Um, Home burglary. So last night I was playing SimCity and realized that when there's a thief walking around the street in the game, you can click on them and you can see where they actually live. So I started bulldozing their houses while they're (laughs) out thieving. What? And I'm like, it's fun to play judge, jury, and bulldozer. (laughs) Yeah, so... So it's like a harsh punishment from Matthew. I bulldoze their house while they're out stealing. So they have nowhere to go or they're yeah. done. Matthew is tough on crime in his <laughs> Sim City. Oh, boy. After their successful stagecoach robbery, Bill Miner, Alkali Jim, and their accomplice Charles Cooper found themselves in Stockton, California, not named after Matthew. Alkali Jim tasked Cooper with buying a shirt, leaving him behind with some money while he and Miner vanished with the loot. Cooper's subsequent search for his partners in San Francisco and San Jose ended in his arrest and decision to inform on Miner and Alkali Jim due to their betrayal. Meanwhile, Miner and Alkali Jim attempted to trade stolen gold dust in San Francisco, but fled to San Jose upon arousing suspicion. They encountered law enforcement there, leading to a shootout after which they escaped. Continuing their criminal activities, they weighed and traded their gold dust before heading to Mayfield, where Alkali Jim was arrested at his girlfriend's house. Despite efforts to escape and hide additional loot, law enforcement, using information from Cooper, managed to apprehend Miner in San Francisco. Both Alkali Jim and Bill Miner were indicted for robbery, with their trials resulting in a 10-year sentence to San Quentin each. Bill for his second time. Their desperate and ultimately failed escape attempts from jail underscored their determination to avoid punishment. Despite turning state's evidence to convict Bill Miner and Alkali Jim, Cooper returned to further criminal activities. Bill Miner and Alkali Jim Harrington returned to San Quentin in 1871 after their original sentences were overturned due to a successful appeal against being tried in shackles. 
However, their retrial in Calaveras County resulted in even harsher 13-year sentences each, aimed at discouraging similar appeals, effectively ignoring any previous time served. In the late 1800s, San Quentin State Prison, established in 1852, exemplified the period's harsh penal approach, prioritizing punishment over rehabilitation. Conditions within the prison were notoriously severe, with overcrowded cells, insufficient provisions, and a lack of adequate bedding and clothing to withstand the cold, damp climate of the San Francisco Bay Area. Nutrition was poor, and inmates endured forced labor without significant privileges or sentence reductions, contributing to the prison's operations and various state projects under strict supervision. Disciplinary measures were stringent, including corporal punishment and solitary confinement for infractions, with strict rules limiting communication to prevent escape attempts or rebellions. Medical care was rudimentary, failing to address inmates' health needs adequately, and opportunities for recreation and education were minimal. Despite the harsh conditions, escape attempts were common, though seldom successful, due to the prison's strategic security measures. The inmate population, including long-term old cons, which Bill Miner now was, navigated a complex hierarchy, finding ways to secure small privileges and engage in limited leisure activities. However, the overcrowded conditions also led to violence and exploitation among other inmates. Overall, life in San Quentin in the late 19th century was marked by extreme hardship and minimal prospects for rehabilitation or improvement, reflecting a broader punitive focus in the penal system of the era. Facing an extended sentence, Minor pursued legal routes for his release, writing numerous appeals and highlighting the retrial's unfairness and his mother's health. His efforts reflect a deep entanglement with the criminal justice system characterized by failed escape attempts and, of course, more punitive repercussions. After one escape attempt, Bill was flogged in the prison yard in front of the other inmates as a warning. He was then sent to solitary for an extended stint. Bill Miner was eventually freed from solitary confinement, yet remained under strict surveillance by the prison staff. For an extended period, he was forced to wear an Oregon boot, a heavy device attached to his right leg to hinder any escape attempts. After completing nine years of his doubled sentence, Miner was released on July 14, 1880. At the age of 33, he had already spent the majority of his adult years behind bars. After being released from San Quentin, Bill Miner moved to New Mexico and then Denver, Colorado, adopting the alias William A. Morgan. Despite the harsh treatment in prison, Miner wasn't embittered and reinvented himself as a sophisticated Southern gentleman. He associated with Billy Leroy, a notorious outlaw, and engaged in criminal activities there. After escaping a lynch mob following a failed stage robbery, Miner headed to Chicago and later to Onondaga, Michigan, where he posed as a wealthy heir, quickly integrating into local high society and getting engaged. However, by February 1881, after depleting his funds on a lavish lifestyle, Miner claimed he needed to care for his ill mother and left after a farewell banquet. Back in Denver by March, Miner sold his fine clothes for practical gear and with Stanton T. Jones planned to rob the Del Norte stage, demonstrating his ability to swiftly adapt and navigate through both high society and the criminal underworld. With Stanton T. Jones, Miner resumed his criminal activities, holding up a stagecoach for a modest haul and exhibiting his characteristic politeness during the robbery. After the robbery, Miner and Jones fled north, stealing horses to escape Sheriff Armstrong's pursuit. Despite their careful planning, they were captured without resistance, but managed to escape after Miner, who had hidden a revolver, disarmed their guard during a night camp. They fled to Arizona, where Miner's hands up became a known command among stagecoach drivers. The Pinkerton Agency, noting a pattern of robberies matching Miner's M.O., began to close in on him as he made his way to California. In Chinese Camp, California, Miner recuperated from illness and planned a stagecoach robbery with new accomplices, leading to a successful heist that resulted in significant loot. However, the robbery's connection to Miner was uncovered when he sent stolen sheet music to a woman he met at a ball, leading to a concentrated effort by law enforcement to capture him. 
Detective All of Wells Fargo, aided by Pinkerton detectives, launched a determined manhunt that led them to Miller's Ranch, a known hideout for criminals. After a tense standoff, Miner and his accomplices were captured. Despite initial resistance, one accomplice's confession led to the conviction of Miner for stagecoach robbery, resulting in a 25-year sentence. Miner returned to San Quentin just before Christmas, and this marked another chapter in his long history of incarceration. More after a quick break, including his time in Canada. If you're looking for a smoking gun, I can absolutely guarantee you, you will not find it. In October 2001, a series of letters filled with a deadly powder called anthrax were dropped into the U.S. mail system. What started as an unprecedented case turned into an unsettling mystery. Who sent these deadly letters, and why? From Campside Media and Sony Music Entertainment, I'm Josh Dean, and this is Cover Up Season 4, The Anthrax Threat, available now. And we are back, Matthew. Thoughts on at the halfway point? It's such an exhausting way to live, Mike. Like, mm-hmm. you're, you're telling me the story, and I'm like, I was thinking the other day when I was watching a TV show where all these criminals were like at war amongst themselves and with the police. And yeah. I was thinking there has to be an easier way to live and to make money. Like, like who would, who would choose? to live like this and that goes with any sort of ongoing criminal like that getting caught and stealing and stuff like like this it, it's sort of like it it just seems so hard like yep. I, like, it, like getting a job would be easier i know? think it would it's not as lucrative getting a job isn't as lucrative it's like the old uh you know people dealing drugs or whatever like it's hard to come back to a joe job because you don't have the glitz and the glamour but did you ever read the book for economics i have not a lot of people have told me that i should and i do i do intend to read it there's been lots of books right mm-hmm. so so one of the chapters is about how low level drug dealers in places like new york actually make less money than they would working at mcdonald's <laughs> there you go so it's a myth Yeah. (laughs) Wow. Upon his return to San Quentin, Bill Miner was closely monitored due to his history of escapes. Yet he initially surprised prison officials by working diligently in the jute mill without causing issues. Despite this, Miner made another escape attempt, resulting in the loss of over four years of accumulated good time and subsequent confinement in the dungeon. After serving nearly two decades, he was released on June 17, 1902. Adopting the alias Bill Morgan, Miner left California to stay with his sister in Bellingham, Washington, just across the border from Vancouver, B.C. He entered a world transformed by technological advances and new law enforcement techniques, including telegraphs and photographic records kept by Pinkerton's detective agency, making it harder for fugitives to evade capture. Miner discovered that the landscape of crime had also shifted with the decline of stagecoach lines due to their vulnerability to robbery. Mine managers had turned to the railroad as a safer alternative for transporting gold, presenting new challenges to robbers. With its speed and fortified express cars, trains required outlaws to adapt their strategies beyond simple highway robbery to successfully target these moving fortresses, signaling a new era in the annals of North American outlawry. But this didn't stop Bill Miner. He loved a challenge. After two decades in prison, 54-year-old Bill Miner, unfazed by his past ordeals in San Quentin, refused to retire from his life of crime. He soon befriended Charles Hohen, a young orphan and another man who called himself Williams, forming a new gang. The group concocted a plan to rob a train, leading to an attempted heist near Portland involving dynamite and a confrontation with train personnel that resulted in injuries, but ultimately failed due to inexperience and mishaps. Uh, He's at it again. This this guy's just incredible. Mm -hmm. He's dedicated. To his profession, that's for sure. He certainly is. <laughs> I mean, may- maybe he likes doing it. I have a feeling he's going to keep going from this point on. You are correct. <laughs> <laughs> 
it's kind of nice to be able to talk about somebody who's not killing people. It, it is kind of nice to be talking about, you know, more benign crimes like train robbery. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> Following the botched robbery, Miner returned to Whatcom, Washington, under the alias Bill Morgan to lay low and recuperate. Despite the challenges of quickly changing times, Miner persisted in his criminal endeavors, leading to another attempted train robbery that ended with his companions arrested and Miner evading capture once again. The subsequent investigation, propelled by accomplice Guy Harshman's confession and Pinkerton's detective work, led to the arrest of Charles Hohen and the identification of Miner, though he had vanished. As law enforcement closed in, Miner escaped across the border to Princeton in the interior of British Columbia, assuming another identity as a Texan gentleman, George W. Edwards. He told the locals he owned a gold mine in South America. Why not? Bill Miner, now also known as George Edwards, quickly became acquainted with William Shorty Dunn, a local sawmill worker and prospector. Their friendship grew through shared bear hunting trips and cattle drives, which cleverly served as alibis for their involvement in planning train robberies. Miner became a beloved figure in Princeton, primarily known for his affectionate relationship with his intelligent horse, Pat and his generosity toward local children, offering them free rides and even building a skating rink for their enjoyment. It is widely held that Bill Miner carried out the first recorded train robbery in British Columbia on September 10, 1904, near Silverdale, approximately 35 kilometers, 22 miles east of Vancouver, close to Mission City. While Miner is frequently cited as the culprit behind this heist, Conclusive evidence linking him or his associates directly to the Silverdale robbery has never been established. The Great Northern train robbery near Seattle in 1905 netted $30,000 and was also suspected to be Miner's work. So that explains how he can build a skating rink. Yeah, and he's and he's doing okay at this, but $30,000 back then is is a, is over a million dollars now. Yeah. What was his real name Ezra? Yeah, Ezra. <laughs> yeah, Ezra's a much better name, actually. I think it is. It's fa- it sounds fancier. Ezra yeah. Allen Miner was his. R- my apologies to Billy, who listens and who works at my my local grocery store. I don't mean it that way. Yeah, um, it, it suits you, Billy. But Ezra's a cool name. Um, Thirty grand million dollars, just retire, Billy. Yeah, just yeah. retire. Come on, like it's enough. <laughs> Despite his criminal endeavors, Miner led a seemingly peaceful life socializing with local farmers and families and maintaining a reputation for kindness among the community's children and adults. He always appeared financially comfortable, always having money despite not working traditional jobs. Gee, I wonder where he's getting it. In the spring of 1906, Miner and Dunn joined a new companion, Louis Colcahoon. They planned a quote-unquote prospecting trip to cover their true intention robbing a gold-bearing Canadian Pacific Railroad train. On the night of May 8, 1906, the CPR's Imperial Limited encountered Bill Miner and his gang during a routine stop. Massed and armed, Miner and his accomplices commandeered the train, ordering it to a halt at mile post 116 for what they believed would be a lucrative robbery. However, their plan to raid the mail car for a significant payroll shipment destined for San Francisco was foiled when they mistakenly targeted the baggage car instead, missing out on $40,000 in banknotes and gold, but amusingly stealing $15 and some kidney pills. What's a kidney pill? I don't know. So it's probably <laughs> some weird snake oil thing. Uh, that... That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking this is like 19 hours. Just six. sugar pills. It's, it's like, here's the kidney pills. will help you live longer. And live. Take these. You'll live forever on these kidney pills. <laughs> kidney pills. Oh, my arm hurts. Here's an arm pill. <laughs> here's, yeah, here's, take a kidney pill. You'll feel way better. <laughs> Today, they're called barbiturates. <laughs> anyway. Following the botched robbery, the gang retreated, leaving behind the evidence that led Constable W.L. Fernie and some indigenous scouts on a determined pursuit through the challenging terrain and conditions. Despite losing their horses and being forced to continue on foot, the robbers left a distinctive trail, leading Fernie directly to them. Discovered while casually having lunch, Miner attempted to bluff his way through the encounter with Sergeant Wilson and the posse, claiming they were merely prospecting. However, 
Dunn's panicked reaction and subsequent shootout revealed their true identities. Damn it, Dunn. <laughs> like, really? There's always that one friend, like, even when you're, like, com- when you're all, like, completely twatted and you're trying to get in the nightclub, and, like, the one friend that just acts like a total moron <laughs> so you don't get in. I, I have I, the I, same one that comes to mind every single time this kind of thing comes up. <laughs> and, and I think, yeah, there there was a Dunn in my life when they, whenever we try to get into nightclubs. So. Yep, yep. <laughs> Despite Miner's initial protest, the discovery of specific items and recognition of Miner's tattoos from a $20,000 reward poster description confirmed the lawmen's suspicions, leading to the arrest of one of North America's most notorious bandits and his accomplices. The trial of Bill Miner and his cohorts in Kamloops on May 28th became a public spectacle drawing crowds eager to witness the proceedings against the well-known bandits. The initial jury could not reach a unanimous verdict due to one juror's reluctance to convict, reflecting a sentiment that miners' actions against the CPR were less harmful than the railway's daily operations. A second trial on June 1st swiftly concluded with guilty verdicts and life sentences for Miner and Dunn and 25 years for Colcahoon, highlighting Miners' criminal history and Dunn's violent resistance during arrest. The convicts received public support as they awaited transport to New Westminster Penitentiary, demonstrating miners' continued charisma and notoriety. New Westminster, founded in 1859 and named by Queen Victoria, was the original capital of the colony of British Columbia, selected for its strategic Fraser River location, advantageous for trade and defense. This city was pivotal during the 1858 Fraser River Gold Rush, serving as a critical entry point and supply hub for miners, significantly impacting regional population growth and economic development. Though initially vital as the administrative and military nucleus, New Westminster's role as the capital was brief. Victoria assumed the capital status in 1866 after the merger of the mainland and Vancouver Island colonies. Even in custody, Bill Miner joked and seemed resigned to his life sentence, acknowledging his age and the inevitability of spending his remaining years behind bars. The British Columbia Penitentiary, commonly called the BC Pen, stood as a grim monument to punishment and fear for just over a century after its doors swung open in 1878 until its closing in 1980. This dark fortress, the first federal maximum security prison in the West was not just a jail, but a breeding ground for tales of escapes, hangings, suffering, violence, riots, and hostage takings. Known for its brutal conditions and strict discipline, the penitentiary was home to some of Western Canada's most notorious criminals. Bill Miner's early period in the pen was marked by strict confinement. He worked in the shoe shop to accommodate his bad feet. Outwardly, Miner seemed content and no longer intent on escaping. However, on August 8, 1907, Miner and an accomplice exploited the relaxed security in the brickyard, aided subtly by fellow inmates, to escape through a hole under the fence and over the outer wall using a stolen ladder, initiating a frantic prison alarm and escape response. Despite Deputy Warden Burke's confidence in recapturing Miner and his belief in his impaired mobility due to his bad feet, the escapees initially left clear trails. Yet Miner's distinct shoe prints soon diverged from those of his accomplices, and despite a bloodhound's brief tracking, the search became futile. Bill Miner had vanished again. A reward poster was drawn up. It read, $500 reward with a picture of an elderly-looking Billy Miner below, prisoner number 980. The above reward will be paid for the arrest and detention of William Bill Miner, alias Edwards, who escaped from the New Westminster Penitentiary at New Westminster, British Columbia, on the 8th of August, 1907, where he was serving a life sentence for train robbery. Description. Age 65 years, 138 pounds, 5 foot 8 and a half inches tall, Dark complexion, brown eyes, gray hair, slight build, face spotted, tattoo base of left thumb, star and ballet girl, right forearm, wrist joint bones large, moles center of breast, one under left breast, one under right shoulder, one on left shoulder blade, 
discoloration left buttock, scars on left shin, right leg, inside at knee, two on neck. Communicate with Lieutenant Colonel A.P. Sherwood, Commissioner, Dominion Police, Ottawa, Canada. It's quite a description. Bill Miner's successful escape from prison sparked widespread speculation and controversy. Some doubted the official escape narrative, suggesting instead that prison officials might have facilitated his departure, pointing to the implausibility of escaping through the reported hole. Allegations emerged of prison officials allowing minor privileges, such as unrestricted visitor access and communication, raising further doubts about the circumstances of his escape. These developments prompted calls for an impartial inquiry amidst public unrest and skepticism. We've always loved an inquiry here in Canada. Even Prime Minister Sir Wilfrid Laurier weighed in on Bill Miner's escape from the floor of the House of Commons. Laurier said, quote, the question which interests this country is whether there has been any connivance on the part of anybody in the escape of Bill Minor. No more dangerous criminal, I think, was ever in the clutches of Canadian justice. It was just a fact for which we took some credit that when one of these American desperados came to Canada thinking to play with impunity in this country, the pranks he had been playing on the other side of the line, he was arrested, tried, and convicted. It was a shock when we heard, and we heard it with a good deal of shame also, that he had been allowed to escape from the penitentiary, end quote. After escaping from the New West Pen, Bill Miner's legend continued to grow, though the last documented sighting of him was a visit to a local farm. Interest in Miner resurfaced with a train robbery in 1909, initially suspected to be his work, but ultimately linked to the Haney Brothers, another local gang. Despite keeping an eye on known minor haunts, police had yet to find him reappearing at these locations. Miner later claimed to have spent two years post-escape working various jobs across the United States and even Europe, though those who knew him took these tales with skepticism. He eventually worked at a Pennsylvania sawmill under the alias George Anderson. Still seeking thrills, Miner formed a new gang and orchestrated George's first train robbery in 1911. The heist, while successful in netting $1,000, failed to crack a larger safe containing 65000 bucks. The gang split up, with Miner eventually being captured in a cabin by a posse, misled to believe he was just an old man, until a Pinkerton detective recognized him. Bill denied involvement. However, evidence and his companion's confessions led to his conviction and a 20-year sentence, alongside sentences for his accomplices. Fearing the Georgia prison system, Minor, now an old man, expressed a preference for Canadian imprisonment, but Georgia authorities chose to retain him. They underestimated Minor's resolve. He escaped with a fellow prisoner seven months into his sentence, only to be recaptured. In June 1912, Minor made another astonishing escape during a storm, but was eventually recaptured after surviving a harrowing journey through a swamp. His health finally failed him, and Bill Miner died in the prison hospital on September 2, 1913, concluding the extraordinary life of a legendary bandit who never ceased to seek freedom, even in the face of insurmountable odds. Oh, I'm exhausted. Yeah. He must have died from exhaustion, Mike. He, he had to have. Uh, when I was reading the script, I'm like, he he can't he he can't go on. He can't go on. It he just, just kept, does. He just kept doing it. He's just the energizer outlaw. Yeah, I think you know what? Like he never killed anyone, and you know it's it's theft is theft, and you shouldn't do it. And it's bad, and people right. get scared and all of that sort of yeah. stuff. Yeah, but it seems like he kind of thought of it as a game. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Just sort of maybe he was thinking about a video game. <laughs> yeah. Way ahead of his time, like a hundred and something years. In the 2000s, somebody's going to make a game about yeah, it. Exactly. <laughs> and a dessert. And a dessert. Speaking of desserts. I'm hungry. As well as inspiring that dessert at the keg, Bill Miner's infamous legacy lives on in Kamloops, British Columbia, with a mural on Cactus Jack Saloon and Dance Hall. And Maple Ridge, where, where the Billy Miner pub operated in a historic building by the Fraser River. 
There are tales of hidden loot in Green Lake slash 70 Mile House, B.C., thought to have funded his escapes and remain undiscovered. Miner's story inspired the ballad of Bill Miner by Philip Mills. In 1952, following a proposal by the Princeton Board of Trade, the peak, formerly known as Bald Mountain or Baldy, was renamed Mount Miner to commemorate Bill Miner. Miner had resided on Jack Bud's ranch opposite this mountain from Princeton while he orchestrated some of his robberies. Additionally, Billy's restaurant in Princeton, B.C., bore his name in homage. In 1982, the tale of Bill Miner was adapted for the silver screen by Mercury Pictures, a film company based in Vancouver. The film, titled The Grey Fox, and directed by Philip Borsos, who also co-produced it, introduced audiences to another moniker for the notorious bandit, blending elements of historical fact folklore, and imaginative fiction, The Grey Fox chronicles Miner's life following his release from San Quentin in 1901 up to his capture and subsequent incarceration, surrounded by a throng of admirers. Richard Farnsworth's portrayal of Bill Miner received widespread critical praise, earning the film a Golden Globe nomination and five Genie Awards, the Canadian version of those awards, cementing its status as one of Canada's most celebrated cinematic achievements. Penticton, British Columbia's Tin Whistle Brewing Company, introduced a red ale called Hands Up as a nod to Bill Miner. In 2014, Miner's watch and other items were stolen from the Royal BC Museum in Victoria. The Victoria Police, with assistance from the Port Alberni RCMP, recovered the stolen items and apprehended those responsible. Commemorating the 40th anniversary of the Kamloops Interior Summer School of Music in 2018, the composer Robert Buckley created The Legend of Billy Minor, a concert band piece. This work starts with a ragtime tune that evokes the period of Miner's exploits, moves through a narrative of train robbery and chase, introduces a poignant theme representing Miner's imprisonment, and finishes with a joyful return to the ragtime melody celebrating Miner's infamous legacy. Bill Miner rests in Memory Hill Cemetery in Milledgeville, Georgia, where initially his gravestone was mistakenly placed in an incorrect location, bore a misspelling of his name, and listed an inaccurate year of death. Oh, well, you can't get everything right, or anything in this case. A correctly spelled and accurately dated headstone has since been installed in the proper location, while the original marker remains in its initial position. I guess it's a piece of history. But why do you think Wild West criminals are still so popular with people, Matthew? I don't... I don't really, I have my own ideas about it, but I, I just want to hear what yours are. I think that we have a romantic view of that era where there was, um, I think there's something inside of us that yearns for um, the sort of uh, freedom and independence that the West back then was. Mm -hmm. sort of strike out make your own there were laws but less laws and it was just up to you and it was all free willing and i think there's something innate in us that uh in a society where everything is so confined in so many other ways right yeah. that um that the story of of some within that atmosphere somebody being even freer than everybody else you know yeah, sure trying to get away with things sort of uh resonates with us there you go what are your thoughts I, I think along the same way, and it's just, even though he didn't spend a lot of his life free, he was taking his liberty very seriously by doing whatever he wanted with it, Yeah, you know? Yeah. And I think that's, that's kind of what's attractive to people is just, there's a bit of a zest for life with those old, old-timey criminals, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. And that is it for Dark Poutine episode 314, The Life of the Gray Fox, Bill Miner, Train Robber. That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1-877-327-5786 or 1-877-DARK-PTN. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. All righty, let's listen to our first voicemail. You ready, Matthew? I am ready, Michael. 
You were born on a green light, weren't you? I was born on an amber light, but I just put my foot on the gas. Caution, but you throw <laughs> caution to the wind. Hey, this is Leah from North Carolina. Um, I started listening to y'all in the summer, and I have just caught up. Now, I started at the beginning and worked my way to the end. I'm not one of those people that listens backwards because who wants to hear the update before they hear the actual case. And to celebrate, I have a question for y'all. Oh, first of all, uh, Mike, I think you traded up, and Matthew is like your trophy co-host. So good job there. <laughs> um, I do have a question for you. Did you hear about the man that got hurt during a peekaboo incident? He had to go to the ICU. So y'all have a good day. And um, go shade your hat. Oh dear, oh, it it took me longer to get that than it should have. <laughs> but, oh, I got it right away. <laughs> but oh my goodness. <laughs> I see you. I see you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Leah. From thank you so much. North Carolina, was it? Yeah, I think so. I love uh, it when people say y'all. Y'all. What what do you think she does down there in North Carolina, Matthew? There's all kinds of things that go on. There are all kinds of things that go on. I think she's a nurse because she's telling bad ICU jokes. Oh, that that could be. <laughs> that that would actually follow. And that would thank, make sense. And, and thank you for calling me a trophy host. Oh yeah, we appreciate that. Now, if my husband would just realize I'm a trophy husband and look after no. me, I'd be happy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm. Oh uh, well, sadly, I'm nobody's trophy. <laughs> I'm just like the trash left out by this curb. No, Mike, don't be hard on yourself. Oh. You're, you're the participation ribbon. Oh, jeez. <laughs> you know, I'm just kidding, buddy. I don't want to be that either. Uh, you know, anyway, I love you. I do. Let's move on to our next voicemail before I start to cry. <laughs> Hi, Mike and Matthew. It's uh, Chana from the South Shore again. I tried to leave a voicemail yesterday, but the reception here is terrible, and I lost you. Um, I was just wondering if you guys had um, this on a list already for future episodes, but I'm wondering if you've heard of the case of Marianne Lam Lamrock. Um, she disappeared in 19, March 1990, and her body was found two years later in January 1992. Um, she had been stabbed multiple times. Um, she was from Shelburne County originally, um, but she, she lived in Lower or in East Pubnico at the time of her disappearance. Anyways, it's, it's a kind of a cold case now. Um, it's really sad. Um, and I find it, it doesn't get a lot of um, highlight, I guess. And it, it would be nice. She, she does have brothers and sisters that are still, you know, waiting for closure. And unfortunately, her mom passed away before they could find out anything. But, uh, yeah, it's a case I grew up hearing about um, because she... She was known for hitchhiking, and uh, they believe that's how it happened. Anyways, um, yeah, my parents used to say about, you know, this is why you don't hitchhike. And, yeah, it just it just always stuck with me as kind of a tragic case. And, I mean, she was 25 at the time when she disappeared. And, um, yeah, it was just, it's kind of been sitting with me the last six weeks because her, the anniversary of her disappearance was back in March. So, anyways, uh I just wanted to bring you guys um, attention to that case. And again, like I said, it's it's on, I believe there's like a substantial reward for information on Crime Stoppers Nova Scotia. But anyways, it, it, it would be a really good episode idea, and I know that you guys said that you would bring attention to either missing or unsolved cases. Yeah. Anyways, uh, just figured I'd give you guys that idea. Um, yeah. It's something I've, I've got a lot of research on myself just because, like I said, I kind of looked into it a few months ago and had some stuff saved and, I don't know, figured it would be a good idea for a show. Anyways, hope you guys have a good day. And if my reception sucks, I'm sorry. Um, anyways, go take crap in your duke. Bye. Well, thanks for calling again. Uh, much appreciated. Oh, that hometown accent really gets me every single time I get so homesick. And so... I I looked up this case uh, when uh, you left this voicemail. Please, please, please email me with everything you have on it, and I'll do some more research, and maybe we'll do uh, a couple. I have some ideas about who I think might be responsible for that. I mean, you know, I'm just throwing it out there. 
But uh, one person who was a serial killer doing his thing in Nova Scotia at the time was Michael Wayne McRae, who was known for picking up hitchhikers and that kind of thing. I don't know if he was in the province at the time, but, you know, uh, it's really interesting. If you want to Google her, Mary Ann Lamrock, L-A-M-R-O-C-K, um, there's a page on the Nova Scotia ca website the government of nova scotia website that tells pretty much everything the police are willing to release and it's four paragraphs so that's probably why you haven't heard anything but if you have more by all means please send it to me and uh, we'll look into doing an episode um, if we can do something maybe this is the hard part about doing uh unsolved cases a lot of times we don't hear anything about what happened until after the person is caught and then the whole thing kind of unravels so um if you have other information than i've already been able to find i would love to have it anyway so that's that thank you for calling and we've got one more voicemail this week okay we we got a lovely i i was laughing my ass off i, lo- I think I, somebody might have been uh, into some festivities yeah and but very 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 fun call but she followed up saying please don't don't play this so we're not yeah. but just to let you know we got your call thank you <laughs> mike and i had a nice chuckle over it we had a bit of a giggle yeah, yeah. and uh, she was talking about the voice her parents liked the voice because it was more uplift or i can't uplifting than american idol was that yeah, the, the something order? yeah or, or the other way around yeah I'm one or sure, the other which is hilarious yeah and then <laughs> she's more uplifting then she said f and reality shows <laughs> <laughs> that's it for this week's voicemails again you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or one 877 We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. So we don't have any patrons this week, but we do have a Donut Money donor uh, who sent us a pretty good chunk. And his name is Dwayne Burke, and he's sent us money before. He says, time for me to pay up again. Take care, fellas. (laughs) Thanks, Dwayne. And uh, uh, so... A, where does Dwayne live? Because he's probably moved since last time, and he's changed jobs. Has he moved and changed jobs? Yeah, sure. (laughs) (laughs) I don't remember which job we gave him or where he lived last time, so... I can't remember either. Uh Is there any way I can... Find no, no. Out. So, we, he has new new stuff because so, he's moved and he's he has new <laughs> jobs. So, I think that he's. You know where I think he lives. I think he lives in. There's an old. Since we're talking about miners in today's episode, sure. There's an old mining town called Bodie, California. Ooh. And, where, where is that? And it, Bodie, California. But and, where is Bodie in California? I don't know. Bodie. So, but it's, what's really cool is, and one article describes it as, uh, it looked like it was left mid-sentence because there's still like, s- the stores are still stocked and the whole place is empty, but there's a curse if you take anything. Mm-hmm. So, so I think he lives in this ghost town in, in, in of Bodie. Ooh. And and what he does is just to freak out the tourists, he sort of like gets up to shenanigans pretending he's a ghost and that's his job. Wow. Yeah. So Bodie, just so you know, is uh in east of the Sierra Nevada mountain range in Mono County, California, and it's about seventy five miles or hundred and twenty one kilometers southeast of Lake Tahoe. That's what I said. <laughs> Did you say <laughs> No, you didn't say that? <laughs> Anyway, oh thank you so much for yes. for for giving. We really appreciate it. it. Extra love from us. Thanks to all our patrons and donut money donors, past and present, for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash dark poutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 
If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening. And tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. And that is it for this episode of Dark Poutine. So until next time, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple and share your Billy Minor pie with somebody when you're at the keg next time. (laughs) Choo-choo! Take care, everybody. Hi, it's Shauna, and I might be a bad parent because my kids think french fries are vegetables. Hey, it's Ryan, and I might be a bad parent because I went out for wings when my wife was in the hospital after giving birth. Johnny here. I might be a bad parent because in my house, the tooth fairy gives pocket change. But we're not alone. Len emailed us and said his six-year-old daughter's Tarzan moment going from love seat to lazy boy by curtains made him more proud than any dance (laughs) recital. (laughs) And Andy left his two-year-old at the rink. All right, guys, I'm sure we're not alone, like Andy's kid. For stories and confessions like this, make sure you check out our podcast. It's called Bad Parents, and it's available wherever you get your podcasts. I left a glove at the rink.